Hey people, Siobhan here just dropping in at the start of this very special episode. Like so many people I'm sure, I've been absolutely devastated hearing about the fires in Australia, the loss of life, the loss of properties, the animals' deaths, the loss of habitat, the loss of biodiversity. It's just been devastating and overwhelming. Today I tried to do my little bit to try and support people who are working very hard, particularly those who are working hard to support animals during these terrible times in Australia. I drove down to the southern highlands of New South Wales today with my friend Elizabeth Usher who does the introduction music to this podcast and we met with people who are managing animal sanctuaries in the southern highlands The first group that uh, we met with was the wonderful people from Sydney Dingo Rescue. In particular, I speak to Charlie. Now, Charlie is currently evacuated. He and all the dingoes are living with very kind people who are hosting them, kind volunteers from the local area. So far, their sanctuary has been safe And it's quite possible that Charlie and the dingoes will be able to return to the sanctuary in the next few days. After speaking to Charlie, I then spoke to Mick and Tracy from Peanuts Wellness Sanctuary, which is located very close to Charlie. Mick and Tracy do an amazing job. They have not been evacuated. They've chosen to stay with their property because they have so many animals that would be very hard to evacuate. But in addition to caring for their own animals, Mick and Tracy are also volunteer firefighters. So when they're not caring for their own animals, they're off fighting fires, protecting properties, trying to help animals in the local area. So these people are heroes. They are working unbelievably hard in very, very difficult conditions to look after animals, to basically try and survive. I have made a donation to both sanctuaries and I really encourage you to have a think about also making a donation if you're in a position to do so. As Mick explains in the episode... It's not just about the cost of the fires, it's also what's going to happen after the fires. There's going to be a very big impact on our ability to produce food for animals. There is a terrible drought in Australia at the moment and so even just simple things such as buying animal feed, buying water is going to become increasingly expensive. So... This is a very special issue of knowing animals. It is focused on people who are trying to protect and save animals during the bushfire crisis. These are just two sanctuaries and as they both have said to me, they're the lucky ones. They have not had loss of property or loss of life so far, but they're doing it tough as are so many people. So I hope you get something out of this episode And I also hope that you think about making a donation either to Sydney Dingo Rescue, to Peanuts Wellness Wellness Sanctuary, or to any one of the very, very worthwhile animal sanctuaries and animal rescue groups around Australia. Okay, that's all for now. Please enjoy this special episode. This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. My name's Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is from our Protecting Animals series where we talk to animal advocates past and present about the work they do for animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. It is a fantastic organisation. It supports animal studies scholars, advocates, artists, 
check them out. Facebook, um, they've got their own website and they're also a membership organisation. So think about joining. Our other um, sponsor for this episode is the Animal Public's book series that is run out of the University of Sydney Press, a Sydney University Publishing. Animal Publix produces really fabulous, diverse, interesting books all about animal issues. So if you're looking to stock up on animal-related books or even if you've got a lazy manuscript lying around and you don't know which publisher to give it to, check out Animal Publix. Okay, now this is a really, really special episode of Knowing Animals. As I said, it's from our Protecting Animals series. As I'm sure every single listener will be aware, we have been having really very terribly upsetting, devastating bushfires in Australia, in many parts of Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia, South Australia have all been affected. Um, It has been upsetting. Uh, We have had loss of human life. We have abundant loss of animal life. And on this episode, I really felt that it was important to to say something about the fires and to speak to some of the people who are in their day-to-day lives rescuing animals and who are also trying to help animals and rescue animals within the context of this fire. So I'm really, really privileged to be joined by someone who's working really hard in that context. Um, My guest today is Charlie Jackson-Martin. Charlie's one of the founders and also the shelter manager at Sydney Dingo Rescue. Now, I was really lucky to meet Charlie at an ACER conference in New Zealand. Charlie is a master's student and is very interested in animal studies. But in this context, I'm talking to Charlie as someone who is obviously working with dingoes and foxes, but also, as I said, uh, dealing with the fires. So we're going to talk about a whole lot of different issues, but also get on to the fire crisis. Um, Now, if people are listening to this episode and they'd like to make a donation, um, Sydney Dingo Rescue does, of course, take donations. And I'm going to put a link to the donations um, site on um, the show notes. So please do think about making a donation. But before we get to all of that, I have to say welcome to the podcast, Charlie. Thank you so much for having me on uh, and being interested in finding out what's going on in our little corner of the world at such a difficult time. So, Charlie, before we get to all the recent... um, nightmare that that everyone's living through can you start by telling us a little bit about how the sanctuary came about why you started working with animals yeah well look it's been a a lifelong thing I think that anybody who knew me as a child wouldn't be surprised to know that I now run an animal rescue I was the kid who would come home with a bird that I'd found on the way home from school that had fallen out of a nest or I once took a free to good home pony uh, home while my mum was at work. Um, so, but the, the the rescue in its current embodiment uh, started in my terrace house in 2012 in Enmore. Um, I was a cat rescuer at the time. I was fostering cats for CPS and some family friends had found a baby fox. Um, or we call them fox kits and asked if I would take him um, at least temporarily to bottle feed him. And I guess I thought that there would be some kind of existing system or infrastructure uh, of care for these animals. Um, and what I got told consistently by so many different organisations was that we should we should put him to sleep and that he was a pest. And I guess you could say that the rescue was kind of born in response to that out of a certain level of stubbornness um, and frustration that nobody was doing anything to help foxes and then uh, cats, dingoes, rabbits and other animals that we often consider to be ferals or pests came later. Um, We really do kind of stand for the underdog or those animals that cannot go to a domestic animal rescue or a wildlife rescue. So you would often fall through the cracks if, if we weren't there to help them. Yeah. So now we're home to about... I think 75 at the moment are rescue animals. So that's um, dingoes, foxes, cats, rabbits. We also have a rescue rat that I bottle fed, a wild rat called Ramsey. Um, She's a smallest sanctuary resident. So just a few animals. Wonderful. And so for our international listeners, could you tell us a little bit about 
Australian attitudes to foxes and also perhaps a little bit about dingoes? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that Australia, we're certainly not entirely unique in that introduced species in other countries face some pretty uniformly bad treatment. But I think that the way that we engage with what we call invasive animals or feral animals in Australia is extreme. Um, in Australia, foxes who've obviously come here from the UK uh, are, are baited. So we we use some pretty noxious baits like 1080. Um, we also hunt them, shoot them. There are bounties in some states where you can take in a dead fox and receive money for them. Um, we also use things like carbon monoxide, which gets put in their dens. So they face some fairly atrocious treatment, um, often under the guise of environmentalism. So sometimes... Uh, we will hear about uh, the way that foxes impact native animals. Um, but realistically, the biggest driving force behind the fox culling and, and in general our hatred of introduced species, so also things like rabbits and cats, is really the agricultural sector and the agricultural industry um, that kind of drives that. And I think one one kind of quote that, that drives that home is from uh, Fiona Probin Rapsi on uh, ferals. She said that essentially there are there are about 7 million foxes in Australia and that does sound like a huge number until you remember that there are 130 million sheep. And so which one of these is doing more environmental damage? It's fairly obvious that the sheep and the land clearing uh, and other kind of environmental degradation that happens with livestock farming is far, far worse than um, than any of our introduced species who are just trying to survive. And so then how does the dingo fit into that picture? Um, you know, dingoes, of course, were here pre-colonisation, but there's all this debate about purebred and whatnot. How, how do they fit in? Yeah, look, dingoes are really interesting in that they do kind of occupy this liminal space between native and introduced. And part of that is this idea of purity, as you said. So the idea that a pure dingo is a native animal and should be conserved. But as soon as that dingo makes the choice to breed with dogs and, and dingoes do readily hybridize with domestic dogs, that those are then feral or wild dogs that should be killed. And I mean, we reject that entire notion I guess as a rescue so for us we use what we call a social model of defining a dingo which is that if a canine is living in the wild in Australia in a family group surviving generationally and is wild then that dog is a dingo like if they look like a dingo and they sound like a dingo and they act like a dingo they're probably a dingo but uh, that isn't a universally shared belief and I think that Again, the agricultural sector has a very vested interest in perpetuating ideas of dingo purity because if they can say there are no pure dingoes left, all dingoes have hybridized with domestic dogs and are therefore, you know, ferals now and have crossed from that line from native into feral, then they can kill them. And that's, that's, and that's what happens. So in New South Wales, certainly um, dingoes and feral dogs are legislated as one and the same. They can be shot on site, they can be baited, they can be poisoned, um, uh, trapped with snare traps um, because there is this idea that that because they're not pure, that they're no longer valuable, you know, even though dingoes obviously have uh, no notion of purity in these kind of human-created species boundaries. So, Charlie, you've already taken on a really tricky proposition you're providing care to the most kind of detested animals in Australia animals that a lot of people would like to see killed and you have a sanctuary which is in an area in Australia which does regularly get exposed to fire certainly in summer and then this incredible situation of the fires this year are upon us can you tell listeners a little bit about what it's been like? Yeah, look, I mean, we're certainly not alone in having been impacted by the bushfires. There are a lot of sanctuaries in our region. I think that when you do run an animal sanctuary, finding somewhere where you can get a large amount of affordable land usually does mean living in the bush and taking on the burden uh, of potential bushfires. Um we're very lucky in some ways that we can evacuate our animals. Um, 
we fundraised very hard to buy some large dog trailers, crates, temporary enclosures. Um, and so for us, as soon as a fire gets close, we do make the decision to leave um, for our animals. Uh, and this fire season, we first had a fire near Braidwood that was um, just enormous 30 kilometer fire front um, that was very, very close to us. And so we evacuated for a week. That fire was then gotten under control. That was in uh, early December. And now over Christmas and New Year's, we've had to evacuate a second time, this time because of the Karawan fire and the Jacka fire. So we had fire kind of on two two sides of the sanctuary. Um, at this stage, the sanctuary property hasn't been burned, but it is 100 acres of dense bushland. We're down a dirt road. So when it came down to it and we spoke to the RFS, we made made the decision to get all the animals out. The foxes, uh, our 16 foxes, are, are boarding up in Sydney at our vet. They unfortunately uh, have very strict regulations about where they can and can't stay um, under our permits. The dingoes, uh, we've taken the 40 dingoes to a uh, property of one of our volunteers uh, where it's a bit safer. And then our other small animals have all had to go into foster care. So it, it has been quite a process. So <clears throat> I live in Sydney, very, very secure. I've, I provide care for two animals and I feel exhausted. Can you say something about what it's like in terms of how it affects your routine and the emotional toll and just that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, look, burnout is a huge issue. A lot of our volunteers are absolutely exhausted at this point. When we're home at the sanctuary, obviously the animals have large outdoor enclosures um, with lots of things to do and keep themselves busy and, uh, and we just kind of supplement that environment with walks and toys and things but the pressure is a lot less than when we have them here and they're in a much smaller space um you know about eight hours of my day at the moment is spent walking dingoes I reckon I've lost five kilos in the last two weeks um I haven't had a lot of sleep and I guess the other thing that's been tough is that we have had to put some other things on hold so a lot of what the rescue also does is education and advocacy work and we just haven't had the time to run the normal advocacy campaigns that we do. I'm also very involved in the Animal Rescue Collective, which is a group that assists other rescues and wildlife carers across Australia. And I would normally spend quite a bit of my week working on Animal Rescue Collective stuff as well. And some of that has had to be put on the back burner um, because it's just that practical concern of walking, cleaning, feeding, repeat with a, with a bit of sleeping in between if we're lucky. So people listening, if they want to support you, what's, what is something they can do to support you? Yeah, look, at this stage, the thing we're encouraging people to do the most is to try to get involved with the Animal Rescue Collective because that's a group that not only supports us but is supporting thousands of other wildlife carers and rescues across the state. Um, they've been giving out small grants uh, so that rescues and sanctuaries can fill their dams with water, can buy fire trailers, can install sprinklers. They've been helping uh, bushfire-affected families look after their animals uh, and animals that have been made homeless putting out wildlife feeding stations and things like that. We're going okay for donations and we'd really like to kind of share the resources, I guess. Um, and the Animal Rescue Collective is definitely doing that. They are sending out literally thousands of kilos of uh, kangaroo pellets right now to feed starving wildlife, setting up water stations, nesting boxes. They have a Facebook group and also a website. Um, and what a wonderful part of what they've been doing is setting up drop-off locations right across the state. So you can go online, you can have a look at where the nearest place where you can drop off supplies might be. So whether that's things like medical supplies, food, um, it might be as simple as cleaning out your linen cupboard and giving you towels uh, or pillowcases that can be used for wildlife carers and things like that. Um, and yeah, finding a local rescuer in need. Mm, wonderful. Well, Charlie, I know that you don't have long. You very kindly um, allowed me to come to the property that you're evacuated at, but you're about to go and start walking many, many dingoes again this afternoon. So I really appreciate your time. I would like to ask you the five quick questions, but we'll keep them quick because I know you've, the dogs are waiting. Can you recall when you first started to think that there was something wrong or problematic about human-non-human -human relations? 
Oh, that's a big one. I think probably since I was a kid, I've I've been I was vegetarian before I was vegan from when I was about eight years old. So we had rescue chickens, um, and I think that was probably a pretty c- kind of crystallizing moment to be like, these are my these are my friends. These are animals that I spend time with, and and I don't want to eat them. <laughs> Wonderful. Can you recall the first thing you did to try and bring about change for animals? Oh, um, yeah, that's another, that's another big one. I mean, I've, I've rescued animals since I was a kid, but, but probably starting the rescue was the biggest thing was kind of taking on this, this seemingly impossible problem back in 2012. And yeah, thinking something has to be done for feral animals and something has to be done better than, than what's sort of going on now. Um, so probably, yeah, probably starting, starting the fox and dingo rescue. Wonderful. If you had to name one animal advocate who's had a big I- impact on you, who would it be? There's so many people, but when I thought about this question, uh, the first person who kind of really came to mind was Arian Wallach, who's a, a conservation, well, a compassionate conservationist. And um, she was really the first person, even when I was running the fox rescue, we were still really saying, well, we love foxes. We think foxes deserve humane treatment and care, but foxes are not meant to be here and Arian Wallach really turned that around for me one day she sat down she said why are you guys saying that like foxes have been here for 185 years you know cats have been here similar time like isn't it time that we started to actually change the way that we live with them uh and it's not enough to say they need humane treatment like they deserve their citizenship they deserve to be here um and uh and the ecology uh, and the ecosystems that they live in are very complex and animals, non-human animals have been adapting to live with them for hundreds of years. And it's time that we caught up and started making changes to be, you know, to coexist more compassionately with them. So, and that was quite revolutionary, I suppose. Wonderful. And Aaron's past guest, she's been, been ah. here twice. Very, very, very good thinker. What's the most important thing animal advocates can do for animals? I think it is just about changing our relationships and I think that it is about building empathy. So I think that spending time with non-human animals is really key. Um, I think that that is the best way to grow empathy and community Um, and I think that, yeah, it's all kind of good in theory um, to think about these issues but but spending time and, and particularly supporting, I think sanctuaries are really special places for that to actually get to know non-human animals and work on those relationships and that empathy. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, if you had the power to change one thing about the human, non-human animal relationship, what would it be? That is a huge question. <laughs> um, I think that, Again, to kind of center it in empathy, I would like to kind of, I would like people to start thinking about non-human animals less in the kind of categories that we put them in. So whether that's feral or pet or livestock, I think that if we could break down those categories, that that would go a huge way to increasing, yeah, animal rights and animal welfare um, for a whole variety of animals. Wonderful. Great, I absolutely agree with you. Well, Charlie, it is just the start of what is probably going to be a very long and very hot summer. So I have absolutely everything crossed that your property and all your animals survive and that it isn't too traumatising. Indeed, I hope that you can return to the sanctuary soon and you're not evacuated again. But thank you so much for making the time for us today. Really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you so much for uh, having us on the show. Thank you. Okay, well, that was so fascinating hearing from Charlie and anyone who can do anything to support uh, Charlie, please do. But I'm really, really fortunate to be joined by another uh, couple who are also people running a sanctuary in the same area, just a few k's away. So I'm really pleased to be joined by Mick and Tracy from Peanut Sanctuary. Peanuts is really close to Sydney uh, Dingo Rescue 
Um, the, the folks at Peanuts have also been trying to rescue and protect and save animals of all species for a long time and are also in this very difficult position of trying to do it under these terrible drought and now fire conditions. And in fact, um, beyond just being people who are obviously very compassionate towards animals, Mick and Tracy are also in uh, the RFS, which is the um, Rural Fire Service. So they're also actually out there on the front line uh, fighting fires. Peanuts is also in urgent need of donations. And again, please go to the link at the podcast notes to make a donation. But we'll come back to that again in a moment. For the moment, it's a big welcome to the podcast to Mick and Tracy. G'day, how are you going? I'm Mick. Hi, I'm Tracy. Wonderful. Look, thank you both so much. So, can you start by telling us a little bit about your sanctuary, why you set it up and what your aims are? Yeah, um, Peanuts Wellbeing Sanctuary uh, was set up because we found the need um, to uh, rescue uh, abused animals from various situations um, and also work with children from the that have come from disadvantaged homes and abused homes, you know, like the foster care system. Um, so we uh, decided to start up our sanctuary and work with both those, uh, bringing them together to teach uh, empathy and compassion uh, with the kids. And it's it's working out fabulously well as, as the kids that have come uh, hear the stories of the animals and realise that these animals have been treated very similar to them. So they start to open up share their feelings and they understand that you know animals have feelings and and they start to express themselves which is is something that most people do they just bottle their feelings up inside and live with it so that's what we do wonderful and can you tell us a little bit about the the sanctuary and the kinds of animals that you have living there we have a selection of different animals uh they come to us as needed and um, so we've got um, some sheep and bulls and cows and a few domestic and that as well and goats um, and everyone interacts differently with different animals but all of them have a story all of them have come to us from different areas. Oh how wonderful so under normal circumstance you know life is a is is rewarding rescuing animals but it's also a grind there's there's often not enough space, not enough money and in the drought you need to buy food and water, etc. But of course this is now extraordinary times. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like living through these fires? Uh, yeah, as you mentioned before, both me and Tracy are in the rural fire service. So we're not only been uh, running the sanctuary, uh, looking after our animals, trying to uh, set up fireproof Uh, systems to protect the animals uh, when the fire front hits we've also been on the front line fighting the fires watching how they act um, and trying to stop the fires getting to us and and other areas and it's been very good for us because being on the front line we actually have the opportunity to see wildlife uh, flee the area and when we go back to make sure the fires are totally out we get the opportunity to see if there's any injured animals out there, then get the appropriate people on to try and help them. Um, And they come back to our place and we help them there as well. So we we see it from everywhere, yeah. And so I know that there are people all around the world who have been watching the fires and many of the kind of the animal people, people very interested in animals who have been feeling very distressed can you say something about what it is doing to animals in the area, what it's been like for animals trying to survive? Yeah, it's been very difficult uh, for the animals and unfortunately they don't have a voice so we need to speak up for them. We do have a number of situations where we've gone in uh, to help them because unfortunately uh, sometimes they believe that shooting them is just the easy way and for them but we find that the majority of them we can go in and we can rescue them and save them and they just need a bit of loving care. So are you detecting that there are attitudes, different attitudes towards different types of animals being expressed by members of the community? Yeah absolutely with uh, more domestic animals or horses and dogs and things like that they are quick to try and help and save them but when it comes to animals that they call livestock or pests or things like that uh, they do believe that 
it is just easier to shoot them than to actually get them help, which in a lot of cases and cases that we have seen, it is simply getting a vet and a bit of care and they would be fine. And are there the resources, if we had the right mindset, are there there the resources to provide help to the animals that need that? Yeah, absolutely. We've had an abundance of people come forward. We've had vets that have said that they will come in and check. And we're actually in a cut-off area, so where no one actually can get to us. But we can get resources, like we could get a vet in and things to help. So we can get food in. Um, and we do that through um, us being able to do it through because we are in the RFS and because we can help um, get trucks in that through. And I know that there'll be a lot of people listening who will have seen the images of the fires and followed them, followed it closely. Can you say a little bit about the kind of the ferocity or, or what it's actually been out there? What's it like when you're actually facing the fire and trying to, you know, save homes and properties and animals, etc.? Um, yeah, being on the front line, um, you've seen the images on TV, but to actually be on the front line and, and see that a fire coming towards you, we can fight that fire and we can put that fire out. And even though there's no smoke, we can come back an hour later and the ground and the leaf litter is still so hot that with the slightest bit of wind, it'll actually flare up and the flames will jump up again. And it, ca- it catches you totally off guard. The fires that we're out fighting this year uh, have not been seen before. It's literally caught uh, some of the most seasoned firefighters in my unit um, actually gasping for breath with disbelief. It's, it's in- it is incredible. But we go out, we do our job, we protect our homes, we protect the animals, uh, we protect ourselves, uh, and we try and keep it at bay. But it's... The, the, the ferocity is to just have like a just a flicker of a flame to a raging inferno in just a matter of 90 seconds it's 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 so scary it's so hot um, it, it's it is hard to explain and and for us to be on the front line it's yeah it's 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 horrendous yeah so sadly it's just the start of summer here so we've got a long way to go and I have absolutely everything crossed that that your property and your animals remain safe but for people listening who want to support you and want to do something positive what is it that you need what can people do to support you uh we've got a a number of people that that are trying to to get in and help us look after the injured uh, animals that are out there and unfortunately as tracy said we are in in a, a cutoff area where there's roadblocks set up because of the dangers of falling trees their their first priority is is to make sure people are safe and i totally get that um but uh, monetary donations so that we can buy items and materials that we can't get. We've had donations of uh, first aid supplies like bandages, ointments, creams, uh, burn products to uh, help the animals. But uh, obviously some vets can come out and they can do so much uh, if you're free of charge, but at some point they're going to need to be able to buy fuel and more medical medicines and stuff. So monetary donations goes a long way to help pay those bills Um, we've had donations of food come in stock feed which being in a drought that we are it it is already hard to get and the price of that just keeps going up and up and up and now with the fires obviously um, it's burning out the paddocks and stuff that they actually make the hay bales out of so we we're just not sure what's going to happen in the in the the aftermath of these fires of of where everything's going to come from so being able to buy or store bagged stock feed like loosened chaff, dog biscuits, wild bird seed, etc., into a shipping container that we can continually distribute out in the aftermath of these fires. That's that's a big thing. So the donations of of bagged feed items and monetary items it's it's probably the key things for us, I believe. Wonderful. Well, I am am going to make a donation online this evening. Can you please let listeners know the address that they can go to to make a donation? Our website is peanutswellbeingsanctuary.org.au and you can also find us on Facebook or Instagram which is just under Peanuts Wellbeing Sanctuary.
Wonderful. And I'm also going to have a link in the in the show notes. Now, I ask everyone who comes on the program to answer five quick questions. I know you've got to get back to finding the fires <laughs> and caring for all your animals, yeah. so we will make it quick. But is it okay if I ask you the five quick questions? Yes, sure. So can you recall when there was when you first started to think that there was something problematic about the relationship between human and non-human animals? Uh, this happened for me many years ago when when I was a teenager and um, I was fortunate to be raised by a mum that was very loving and she took in a lot of foster children and all the animals that we had were rescued. So I actually grew up watching the combination between the children that were abused and the animals that were abused and how they used, they would bond. And I realised that if you teach the children compassion and caring, it actually breaks that cycle of abuse. So they will grow up to love and care for animals rather than go down that same cycle of abusing them. Wonderful. Well, can you recall the first thing you did to try and bring about change for animals? The first thing that I did was I actually stopped eating them and um, because uh, the way I was raised. So, um, and then literally I just went about uh, advocating for them, like just talking to people about them, the compassion, showing them that, you know, they have feelings, they feel the same as us. And if we show them compassion, that helps us show our peers compassion and everyone else around us. It's only just better for society. Wonderful. Well, if you had to name one animal advocate who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? It would be a Clydesdale that we cared for for a long time called Rosie. Uh, I grew up uh, riding motorbikes and those motorbikes, you control those motorbikes. But with a, a horse, they have a mind of their own and they may do things that you don't want them to do at a certain time. So I actually had a fear of, of horses. But Rosie the Clydesdale, when I met her, she come up to me and put her head into me and she was really gentle and I felt kind and caring. And she literally melted my heart and that was my breaking point to understand that, that animals are different, their natures are different, it's us that needs to understand them and, and accept each animal as we do people um and understand how they work and so rosie the clydesdale is what what who melted my heart oh how wonderful so what's the most important thing animal advocates can do for animals um i believe uh teaching we we need to get out there and we need to teach them um we've true believers that children need to be taught um they're not taught at a very young age they become desensitized and then they grow up not actually understanding that animals of all animals um have feelings and care for us so i i believe that teaching is is a huge part um and at a young age they they need to have um be able to be exposed to the, the what animals really like at a young age. Wonderful. Now, final question. If you had the power to change one thing about the human, non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Um, I, If I had that power, I would bring in uh, school-age programs to children from a young age. Uh, I know they teach agricultural and what domestic, uh, sorry, uh, livestock animals are used for, but I believe if they actually ran a program side by side with that, showing that the, the nature of animals and how we need to care for them, that they have feelings from us, children from a young age, they would be able to make those choices themselves instead of just growing up in a world where they say, oh, well, that's just the norm, that's what people do, so we keep doing that. By supplying that educate that that part of education, kids will learn what they need to learn, and that in turn will break that cycle of abuse, and that all becomes uh, part of our philosophy as being older adults. Peanuts by us teaching and not preaching things to children that come out and spend time with the animals, um, they in turn hopefully grow up and have families of their own breaking that cycle of abuse so if we can do that at the school on a national or global level i truly believe that's going to change the way a lot of people think in this world how wonderful well tracy mick i wish you absolutely all the best for the rest of the fire season i hope that we hear that there have not been more fires threatening your property. God forbid any of your animals are lost or any human lives are lost. So please 
please stay safe. And to the listeners, if you can support the, this important work, please do. And we'd like to thank you and all your listeners for enabling us to be able to give a voice to the animals and that that don't have one. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com.